Well, hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Sama Saturday, our monthly show dedicated to canine health and wellness. It's called Sama Saturday, but actually it's Friday. Friday <laughs> for one time because we have our holiday tomorrow and we wanted to make sure that we didn't interrupt that for any of you. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Let us know as you're jumping on with us, who you're watching with, where you're watching from. Um, my name is Amanda Ree. I'm the founder of Sama Dog, and Sama Dog is all about creating offerings, education to support a natural, holistic, even spiritual life with your canine friends. So each month we come together on a different topic with our dear friend, Dr. Katie Kangas, amazing holistic vet and radiant goddess of all that is dogly. <laughs> and we actually are supposed to be joined with Lucy Postings as well. She is having a little technical trouble right now. So we're going to hope that she's able to log on with us. She's up in the hills of Julian. So I think there was a little trouble this morning. So we will do our very best to get her on. But of course, we wanted to carry forward with our show. She just wrote and said they're trying another way. So we'll keep our eyes out for Lucy. Um, she might be coming now. So um, every month we have a topic. Our topic this month is uh, food and nutrition. Oh, I see Lucy. Let's see if we can get her in. Lucy! <laughs> Can you hear Good morning. Us? I, can, I can hear a few little bits of some of your words, so I will try my best to join in. And if it sounds terrible, you can just kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> and you let us know if, if there's any trouble on your side, if there's anything that we can do to fix it. So we were just introducing our topic of today is food and nutrition. We're going to be exploring through a few different topics or a few different conversations within that broad um, you know, body of great information. And I know very interesting facts and support that all of you would like to be able to receive through this conversation. And we are here to serve. There's always a lot to say about food and nutrition. So what we're going to get into are the key differences in uh, fresh food versus dry food and how the body processes them differently. We'll also look at how to best approach utilizing food as medicine for your dog. We'll talk about generally how do we know what foods are safe to feed our dogs and also how do we create some fresh food options without breaking the bank, you know, making something easy and inexpensively um, for your friends to be nourished on every level of their being. So that's what our conversation is going to be about today. I first wanted to share one quick thing with the Sama Dog event that's upcoming. We're super excited about this. It will be July 13th, 17th. So that's just in a week and a couple days and not next week, but the following. It's called Dinner for Your Dogs. And I'm going to be going live. We'll be streaming out as we are now to Facebook as well as YouTube. And I'll be at 5 p.m. for specific time, joining everyone uh, to demonstrate a meal that I'm making for one of my dogs. So we'll do a different one each evening. I'll show you how to start with a variety of different bases. So we'll have everything from kibble to dehydrated to raw to home cooked. We'll have that as our base. We'll add some toppers and supplements. We'll get into the different brands that are out there and what the ones that I know and love so well. So it'll be interactive. Take your questions. It should be a lot of fun. So that is happening again the week of July 13 through 17 at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And it's free to everyone. You'll just log on as you are now. So you'll feel, you'll get a little bit more information about that through our social channels, but we'd love to have you there. So uh, I see that Lucy has gone away again. So we'll just be patient in our interaction with Lucy today. But Dr. Kangas, thank you so much for being here as always. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Boy, if I ever want to feel good about myself, I'll just hop on a show with you and listen to my introduction. So thank you for the wonderful accolades and appreciation. And as always, I'm just thrilled to be here and to contribute alongside of you with all the wonderful uh, you know, mission that you put out there to, to provide more information for everybody to just, you know, do better and better for their pets and themselves. So mm -hmm. thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the beautiful service that you share and all the time that you spend with our audience as well. I'm going to just zoom us in a little bit closer. There we go. There we go. A little bit closer. Um, <laughs> at least for now. But then it's always backwards, right? When you go to straighten yourself out. 
So um, I will route through a few questions and topics, Dr. Kangas, but first let me share, I think most of our viewers and our audience know you and know a little bit about your background, but just in case we have some new followers with us today, I wanna share that Dr. Kangas is pretty much our co-host of the show, so she's on regularly with us. She's a holistic veterinarian, one of the best in the country. She's the owner of the Integrative Veterinary Care Center here in San Diego in Sorrento Valley. She has been practicing veterinary for 25 years, the last 15 years, really focusing and directing more towards holistic care with a specific niche of food as medicine, helping us to learn how to heal our animals, utilizing the array, the buffet of options that are out there for them. And so that's why today is the perfect conversation. I was teasing with you, if there's a day to not have other guests, it would be today because you could easily fill up like a seven hour show. So, <laughs> so we'll have fun people. Dr. King is. Well, I'll so, be eager to hear from Lucy later, but if she doesn't make it today, I can definitely represent a lot of discussion for us. So, Well, thank you for that. And I see she's trying to get back on again. So I appreciate Lucy's effort, no matter what. So for all of you joining in now with us, um, as mentioned, if you'll tell us you're here, but also share it. You know, Give us a like, give us a thumbs up or a heart if you're enjoying this and share this out with the world. This is the way that we've gotten this message out so far is with all of you, every single one of you participating and helping to support this message and help animals all around the world. So you know, there are a lot of places that can't access information like this, but now now we can come right into their home through these channels and it's very important and powerful and impactful to all of those lives. So Dr. Kangas, let's get going into it. Um, first, just kind of kick us off with what are some kind of high level, just the most important things to know as a pet parent when it comes to our dog's food? What do we want to keep in mind most? Uh, a few things from my perspective and really the number one thing, what I like to tell people is really the number one health strategy for your pet is to feed a fresh food diet or at least the freshest food that you can do with your budget and with what works for your pet. And sometimes that might mean combining a few different formats of food and that's fine or enhancing the food that they're eating with you know, some of the nutritious things that you can easily add to their diet. Fresh food literally is the best thing to help your pet thrive. But another very important factor in that is that it must be balanced. So, you know, of course I get a lot of well-intentioned pet parents coming to me saying, you know, I understand now that feeding fresh food is really great. So I've been feeding my dog chicken and rice for the last year or, you know, longer. And so that is another important the discussion that yes, fresh food is good, but it is really important for that to be a balanced meal, at least over time, you know, having a, an unbalanced meal one at a time or for a day is okay. People do that all the time, but we are going to be healthier. Our pets are going to be healthier if our diet is varied and certainly balanced to deliver the nutrients that we all need. So those are two big things, freshest food, you know, least processed, but requires to be balanced in order to be truly healthy, especially long term. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so simple. And yet, you know, we really, some of us struggle. I know I did in the beginning and knowing, okay, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by fresh food? How do I do that without needing to um, cook for an hour a day? And that's, that's right. what And I love that question because honestly, when I first started doing holistic veterinary care more than a decade ago now, mm -hmm. I encouraged people to do some home cooking because honestly, at that time, our, our availability of pet foods that were fresh and good quality was very limited on the market. And thank goodness, there is a whole lot of great options available for pet parents now that weren't avail available even just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Really changed my approach in supporting people to feed their pets in the best way and have sort of moved away. I, I really don't necessarily encourage most people to fully create your pet's diet yourself. Mm -hmm. Really want to do it and you want to invest the time and the energy to learn how to do it correctly, I would support you. But the vast majority of people, that's a huge investment of time and energy. There's a lot of conflicting information out there. So people get really, really confused on where's the best resources. If you don't have access to a reliable vet or nutritionist that you can really depend on, is giving you good information, 
it can be very overwhelming and it can not be successful. And so I really don't encourage people to necessarily create the whole diet. I like to steer people toward wonderful, professionally created, professionally balanced diets for pets that I know are good quality. But I love to encourage people to enhance the food for their pets by adding some simple ingredients that are wonderfully beneficial, you know, profoundly impactful on their health, but easy to add in. So that seems to be a really nice match for a lot of people where you have some active, you know, measures in your pet's diet. It's fun to give them. It's really fresh and you can enhance a completely balanced diet and rely on the fact that you don't have to recreate the wheel with the whole balancing thing. And I do like to also support people to combine things. You know, the diet doesn't have to be one format of food. It doesn't have to be all raw or all dehydrated. It can be a mixture of both or a mixture of a little bit of home cooked and that sort of thing. So lots of wonderful options and more and more things becoming available for all of us as pet parents to, to really utilize well. Hmm. Well, that's a perfect segue into introducing and kind of bringing into the conversation who has now been able to link to us nicely. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear us okay now, Lucy, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Yes, I think I had some gremlins in the Wi-Fi this morning, but I've <laughs> the rest of my phone, so hopefully this will hold out for a little bit. Okay, very good. Well, let me do an introduction of Lucy so that you all know her for anyone that hasn't gotten a chance to meet this wonderful woman. She is the founder and the chief integrity officer of the Honest Kitchen, which is a, a dehydrated dog food, pet food, that most anyone who follows Sama Dog has heard of about a million times because I'm constantly shouting it from the rooftops and always including it in my demonstrations. Um, it's a San Diego-based company. Lucy really started it right in kitchen here in San Diego and grew it from the city. Um, the Honest Kitchen is a family-owned company that makes healthy pet food from minimally processed human-grade ingredients over the past 18 years. Lucy has been a true pioneer in the dog food industry, battling it against suppressive legislation and massive conglomerates. She's really held strong through all of that, changing, revolutionizing the dog food industry all by herself, which is quite remarkable. She is an oracle of what actually is healthy and good and optimum for our dogs to eat. So it's an honor, Lucy, always to connect with you and to have you on our show. Thank you so much. That was a very nice introduction. I'm <laughs> super excited to be here and to be able to join you guys. <laughs> have you been called an oracle lately? I don't know if I have. That might be a first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. So, <laughs> Share with us, and I know there's a little bit of an echo on the line. Some of our viewers are sharing with us that it's a little bit hard to hear, so we'll try to work that out as best we can. Hopefully you guys can hear over it. Um, uh, please, Lucy, share with us, you know, when you're meeting with someone and they're just kind of asking that initial question, what's best to feed my dog? Like, how do I get into all of this? Where do you kind of start with that conversation? Well, I think the first place to start is really just helping people understand the link between real food and, and top health. Um, a lot of people end up feeding very heavily processed diets. They kind of get talked into it by a veterinarian or a breeder or a rescue organization um, and, and sort of just get brainwashed into feeding a very heavily processed diet. And what we really work on at The Honest Kitchen is helping people understand the really tangible health benefits that a, a dog or a cat or any be living being can experience by just simply consuming a healthier, less processed food option. And there are so many different ways that you can incorporate fresh foods into the diet. Um, as Katie was just mentioning, it doesn't have to be a, a completely fresh food made from scratch. There are lots of other fun and interesting ways that you can do it. Well, that's great. And I'm just working with the mics here a little bit um, so that I'm, I'm finding that if we mute me and Katie when someone else is talking, it does take away some of that echo. So there'll be just a little delay uh, for me pushing buttons over here. But that's great, Lucy. Thank you. And it really does help us kind of lay the foundation and start to understand what is lesser understood out there, especially in the marketing influenced industry of dog food. That's so yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, that, that's right. I think there is so much marketing shenanigans that goes on, especially with some of the huge conglomerates that would kind of make you believe that the beautiful pictures on the front of their bag is what's really on the inside. And in fact, mm -hmm. a lot of these foods are really so heavily processed. And uh, so you've really got to scrutinize the labels and understand what's going on uh, behind the scenes a little bit. Yes, definitely. And we will take uh, questions from our audience. So if you all have things that are coming up or you've been wondering, please go ahead and type them in. We'll definitely have time for that. Um, it makes me think, Lucy, when you said what's on the label or even in the images, um, Dr. Kangas and I, a few months back, attended a conversation with Dr. Becker. And I remember her teaching us about, you know, what's in the ingredients, what's on the label and what's on the picture and what's actually enough of a quantity in the food to have any sort of nutritional benefit. And she showed us how sometimes it'll show, you know, beautiful cranberries, like a whole bed of berries. And you'll look on the label and cranberries are one of the very last ingredients. They just kind of threw it in there in what Dr. Becker calls a homeopathic dose <laughs> of cranberries. So I just find that hilarious to think of it like that is like, it's like, it's like the essence of cranberry, but it's not actually enough to do anything beneficial for our dogs. So that is a common ploy in the industry to make us feel like things are a little more healthy. So yeah, so let's kind of, let's start off, uh, we're kind of go back to Dr. Katie. And when you talk about using food as medicine, Dr. Katie, what, what do you mean by that? Beyond just feeding our dog, what, what do you mean by that? Oh. There's that mute problem that we had. There we go. You're on. All right. I was like, I saw your mic is muted, so I figured <laughs> I'm muted. So thank you. Uh, and I love what Lucy said about really demonstrating for people and teaching people that there are tangible benefits. I love how you said that to eating fresh food diet. And one of the, the sort of captions that Amanda included in our description of what we were discussing today, I really like, is discussing how to use foods to provide nutrition beyond just sustenance. And so truly when you break down the word sustenance to what that really means, it means to sustain, just to sustain existence or su sustain life. We wanna do better for our pets and for ourselves. We don't wanna just exist, we wanna thrive. So anytime we're using fresher ingredients the body is going to be able to utilize the nutrients in those ingredients to really put, you know, physiological processes in the cells to, to create all of the metabolic functions in the body more appropriately with more vitality. All of those things happen when we feed a fresher food diet as a standard course over a heavily processed food. And one of the things that I love to see as a integrative or holistic practitioner is that when my patients move from a heavily processed, typically dry kibble diet to a fresh food diet, very quickly people see those tangible benefits. And you know they see better mobility, better hair coat, brighter eyes, more vitality, more energy, more mental connection in older dogs. All kinds of things can change when you go to a fresh food diet. So it's really fun to see that in action, this tangible, results in action. But the, the caveat to that is it does need to be balanced in order to continue that, you know, success. So what I have seen is that when people switch from a heavily processed food to, uh, say, home prepared or unbalanced diet that just has a few fresh food ingredients in it, that initially they still see those great results like, wow, my pet's thriving, they're on this fresh food. But it's 6, 12, 18 months down the line of not having an appropriately balanced diet where it starts to take its toll and then little disease symptoms start creeping in and oftentimes it's not recognized as a nutritional imbalance it's thought to be you know its own disease process and and that sort of thing but nutrition always matters um, that's always involved so obviously you know being a holistic practitioner and really wanting to feed the body to functionally perform at its best we we turn to nutrition as, as the number one thing. I mean, that's what's providing our food is what is providing all of the fuel for the cells in the body, essentially. I mean, you know, drink water, breathe air and you eat food. And that's what is supporting your body on a biochemical process. So really getting to the scientific level, it's, 
it's it's so essential, but it's also intuitive that that's what the body needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Lucy, what would you say are two or three of the most important things to keep in mind when we're selecting fresh foods for our animals? Um, I think probably the two or three most important. The first one would really be thinking about ingredient safety. Um, so a lot of people, when they think of fresh food, they'll immediately turn to something that's completely raw, which is fantastic for the most part. Um, but you do want to be very careful in terms of how you're handling and storing foods that are completely raw, whether it might be meats, things like chicken. Um, you obviously want to handle it as though you were going to be feeding it to your human family. So using proper chopping boards and utensils to prepare it and so on, making sure it's correctly refrigerated. You don't want to leave it out at room temperature for a prolonged period of time. Um, even things like leafy greens, which people might not always associate with a food safety risk, they can actually um, harbor bacteria. So again, you want to have that proper storage. Um, I think the other thing is phasing in fresh foods um, quite gradually. You don't want to go sort of make an overnight change from doing a very heavily processed dry food or a kibble to instantly making an overnight switch to a fresh food diet. Um, you need to make changes gradually to allow the gut flora to adjust and allow the dog the best chance of, of really being able to digest and utilize all those wonderful nutrients that you're providing into their bowl. Um, and a great way to start off by doing that is just to add a just a small selection of, of goodies and fresh food, something like a little bit of plain yogurt or some blueberries and maybe a little bit of lightly cooked chicken initially. And then you could phase it in um, to be more and more raw over a period of time and allow their, their gut to adjust. Um, so that safety piece is really probably the most important. Um, I think also thinking about um, a full spectrum of colorful ingredients. So one of the most wonderful things about fresh, less processed food is really providing a very broad spectrum of antioxidants or phytonutrients. So things like um, beta carotene and lutein, lycopene, all of these wonderful um, phytonutrients that aren't necessarily even thought about in terms of AFCO nutrient profiles, but can have a profound effect on total health and well-being. Um, so thinking about having that full rainbow of color in the dog's bowl is is super important as well so incorporating some you know orange pumpkin or carrot and some blueberries and green spinach so you've got that that whole rainbow to to provide as many nutrients as you can that's great because we we do think about that or talk that a lot often with our human children you know eat the rainbow and I know um, one of my great teachers, Dr. David Simon, used to always say, and Skittles don't count <laughs> for the kiddos, you know? So yeah, but we oftentimes don't think of that for our animals. And yet, of course, they need those phytonutrients. Their body has toxins and have the same processes that our body has and needs those same nutrients. Yeah. There's a lot of noise coming onto the line I can hear here. I'm just not sure why that's happening. So let's um, go over to Dr. Katie. I'm just going to make a couple adjustments here. Um, we'll go over to Dr. Katie and ask and learn a bit more about the, the actual body, the body of our animals. How does uh, processed food slash dry food versus fresh food work differently in the body? It's, it's really not natural. You know, evolutionary, you know, our, our dogs are really, I mean, clearly very closely related to their evolutionary predecessors, you know, wild canines. And it's really not natural for anybody to be eating food that is heavily processed. And these are foods that are heated at extreme temperatures. So it's definitely altering the bioavailability or even the, you know, the chemical status of the nutrients in there when it's heated so much, the body can't utilize it and absorb it in the same way as when it was fresh. And interestingly, you were just talking about how we all know that it's healthier to eat the colors of the rainbow. And I love how Lucy brought that up, but you know, it's so important too for our pets to have varied nutrients. And it's interesting how the veterinary profession has really sort of strayed away from that as a general conventional rule in that it's the only sector in 
health medicine in the medical community that tells you that processed food is actually better. So we know that human doctors and human nutritionists are always telling us move away from processed foods as much as you can. When you go to the grocery store, buy foods that are natural and whole and colorful and not processed and in a box or a bag, yet we are ingrained and even as Lucy said, sort of brainwashed to believe that this is what is best for our pets. Yet if you handed a bag of drab, brown colored, not any variety of color in it, dry kibble biscuit, if you handed a baggie to a parent of a human child, a pediatrician gives this to their child and or gives it to the parent and says, feed this and nothing this, this and water is all your child needs till they're 18 or 20 and they move away. This is all they need. It will completely provide all their nutrients. And there you go. And most parents would intuitively question that, that that just doesn't seem right. So as far as digesting in the body, really to specifically uh, answer your question, it is not, these foods aren't natural, but they all are also are not containing the level of nutritional quality that we expect that they are. So when things are heavily heated, it, it, chemically alters the nature of the ingredients in the food. And we know, we understand now that anything that's been heated at high temperatures is more inflammatory. We call it pro-inflammatory to the body. So there are things that are created in that heating process reaction, things like AGEs, which is advanced glycation end products, HCAs, heterocyclic amines, sorry, um, that are known to be promoting inflammation in the body and actually carcinogenic as well. And then with a lot of the processed foods, you're also adding, or these companies are adding preservatives that also add more toxin load. So a lot of things are happening in the body trying to digest and utilize these nutrients when the food has been heavily processed. Also dry food, it's not natural for any body to be eating desiccated food all the time it is much more natural to be eating something that's moisture rich. So most fresh food diets are going to contain inherent moisture. Dogs will often drink enough water to make up for the fact that they're eating very dry food. Cats usually do not. So that's a whole specific and important issue with kitties of eating a dry, heavily processed food is that it doesn't contain that natural moisture. It is harder to digest in the body system. And in Chinese medicine food therapy, we're taught about energy in the body, okay? And gu qi, you know, different uh, energy formats in the body that are required to do body processes. And we understand from that training that anytime you eat a heavily processed or very dry, compact, desiccated food, it takes more energy from your digestive, you know, ability in the body to be able to break that down and process it. Fresh food is much more easily digested from that standpoint. However, that said, I do really appreciate the fact that Lucy brought up going slow because just from, just because from a pure standpoint of what is more digestible for the body to receive, fresh food is, but if you take an individual who has been eating a very heavily processed food or simply a food that the body's very used to because that's all it's seen for months or years on end. And then you pop in something new or a lot of new things, you know, kind of lickety split, then you can definitely instigate some problems. So I'm always recommending for people to take baby steps with progressing into feeding your pet different items and don't, you know, start a whole bunch of new things at one time or do it too fast. You'll definitely get more success with less setbacks, letting their digestion uh, ease in gradually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good reminder too, because a lot of us don't know exactly what the steps are to take. And that actually leads me to the next question I had from Lucy. As soon as we unmute, we get all this background noise. So thank you everyone for hearing past it. Um, 
<laughs> it's like there's a little mouse typing. It's typing. Yeah, it's typing. I don't know where it comes. Someone's very diligently, remotely taking notes on all of this for us. Um, <laughs> so my question for you, Lucy, is you started the Honest Kitchen almost 18 years ago now, I think. Is that correct, timing? Yeah. And so you clearly saw a need for your own animals and in, in the marketplace and met that need. So tell us a little bit more about why and how you started the Honest Kitchen and what is what is that food all about? Yeah, so the Honest Kitchen I got it started in 2002 and I was um, I worked for another pet food company at the time and um, was feeding my dog Mosey, who is a Rhodesian Ridgeback. I was feeding him um, a processed brown kibble diet, which is what most people fed back in those days. And Mosey started suffering with some chronic ear infections. And I was spending quite a lot of money at the vets on um, different antibiotics and ear flushes and steroids and things and nothing really brought about a true a true cure it would kind of suppress the symptoms for a period of time and then it just kept on flaring up again and again and i started doing my own research and realized that maybe this processed food was the culprit and, and maybe a, a less processed food diet could be the medicine as well um, and so i started just making up my own meals for mosey with just fresh raw ingredients um, and began feeding that as his sole diet and phased out the kibble and got tremendous results. Um, but I actually ended up making a huge mess in my kitchen in the process. Um, it's, there was a lot of balls of bloody meat in the fridge and um, pureed spinach and broccoli and things all over the place. So I then sort of sat about to think, how could I feed a less processed food without all of the mess and inconvenience of something that was truly raw? Uh, and that's where I came up with the idea for dehydrated food. So literally just removing the moisture from those fresh raw ingredients, still maintaining all of the beautiful colors, the phytonutrients and beautiful pigments and antioxidants that were present in those raw ingredients, but taking away the moisture. Um, to make a blend and then you would just add the moisture back. Um, so that's really how it got started. It was gonna just be a little local business in Pacific Beach and um, sell direct to consumers. And it's it's really um, snowballed over the years, I guess would be the best way to put it. I think um, when I sort of look back now, I realize if you, just, if you make something that's meaningful and has um, a purpose behind it. I think it's uh, it will eventually just gain traction. I think back in the day it was probably a little bit before our time, and I, I sometimes tell the story about when we used to go to our very first trade shows back in the day, and people literally thought we were selling boxes of cat litter because this food looked so uh, visually different from what people were used to seeing when they thought about dog food. Um, but luckily, we're beyond that now, and we've got a full um, a full set of different types of food. Um, the dehydrated is obviously still our core business and then we've got some sort of ready to eat foods that you don't have to hydrate with water um, that are made with a combination of um, toasting and dehydration as well as some um, wet foods that have already got the moisture in them so we've sort of built it out into a full platform now um, but everything we do is rooted in being 100% human food grade so all of our products are made in human food production facilities we don't make anything in pet food rendering plants um, and that's really sort of our line in the sand when it comes to the quality integrity of our raw ingredients that's fascinating and clearly it's my mic that has the issue um it is fascinating Mickey, because i think you were the first dog food company to ever be human grade on the label and you had to really fight for that um ability to put that out into the world in that way so great job many others have followed thankfully but that's a huge deal so uh, let's take a question that came in here. I can put it up on the screen. This, um, Dr. Kangas, you were mentioning this. Can you speak to the impact of carbs on carnivores and inflammation, fresh food types that are best and what to avoid? So, yes, there is a lot of controversy on carbohydrates for carnivores and maybe most specifically grains. So, you know, there's a lot of concern recently about grains in diets. And truly, dogs are thought to be somewhat omnivore, but mostly carnivore. And obviously, if we look at the structure of their teeth and even the, you know, anatomy of their gut, we know that they are intended to be mostly carnivore. 
Uh, and so when they are fed carbs, as is anybody is fed carbs, that promotes a lot more insulin release in the body. By the way, the more often we get insulin release, because carbs ultimately break down to sugars. And this is just not a natural component to be a large extent of the canine diet. And so each time carbs break down into sugars, it drives more um, insulin, which can result in more inflammation. So a, a lot of people may be coming more familiar with the fact that low, lower carbohydrate diets can uh, very, be very supportive to decrease inflammation in the body. So I do like to you know, recommend or steer, steer people toward diets that are low in carbohydrate. Uh, and you know, the, the grain free issue is, is a whole scope that we could, you know, get in very specifically. Um, but there are carbohydrates that are a bit more natural than the grains that can act a little bit differently in the body with lower glycemic index and things like that. So that can also make a difference. Um, fresh food types that are best and what to avoid. Um, you know, as, as Lucy said, I mean, that's such a broad topic. Um, I mean, you want to avoid, in my opinion, you want to avoid anything that is uh, mostly carbohydrate. <laughs> so you want to go for foods that have a lot of fresh human grade, as Lucy mentioned, protein sources, anything that lists carbohydrates very high in multiple sections on the beginning of the ingredient list, I would avoid. And I do have to share, because I think this is noteworthy, that there that there's a lot of sort of scam in marketing, and their companies are now able to do label splitting, by the way, as well, where if, say, you have peas for containing some protein, but there's also a lot of starch in there, they can split that into pea starch, pea protein, pea flour, and have several different things written on the label, which pushes meat to the top even though by weight or by volume, peas actually outweigh meat, but because they split it into three different components, they're able to say that that meat is more when truly this diet is loaded with carbohydrates and that's just not natural. So you definitely have to be very aware and sort of scrutinize the labels, but I would recommend to obviously choose food that I would avoid things that say byproduct or meal, and I would go with fresh whole foods and foods that have a lot less carbohydrate content than the average, you know, traditional processed food in the market. I think you're muted, Amanda. There we go. I can't hear you at all. Lucy? I can't hear you. No, I, I think you're on mute, Amanda. Oh, now it's Lucy and I. <laughs> Lucy, maybe said, Lucy, do you want to add anything to that, to that question? Oh, can you talk a bit about meal? This might actually be a really great one for you, Lucy, because I know you're very versed yeah. in these sorts of topics. Yes. Yeah, so meal basically is um, very often made from um, animal byproducts and some of the sort of um, meat fibers that would be stripped off an animal's carcass after the, um, the human edible parts have been um, taken for use in, in the human food chain um, and basically gets um, rendered, um, which is processed at extremely high heat um, to separate off fat components and things like that. And then it gets dried down into basically sort of a meat flour for want of a better word. Um, and so meat meal in itself is not as bad as, as what you might see as a, um, a meat byproduct meal. Um, poultry byproduct meal, as an example, would be things like beaks, feet, feathers, all of which do actually contain amino acids and technically can be considered as a protein. Um, they get rendered down into this meal, but they're really difficult for the body to assimilate the nutrients from and to digest properly. 
And as you were talking about earlier, Katie, with, when you have that really high um, temperature processing, when that amino acid structure gets changed, it almost makes a protein sort of unrecognizable to the body. So if you had a dog that could eat sort of a piece of chicken breast or um, chicken meat from, a, from the human table with no problems, sometimes if they eat a poultry byproduct meal, it's, it's made with these um, undigestible protein sources that have been then rendered under high pressure and high heat, which changes the amino acid structure, it can actually trigger al allergies or sensitive um, reactions in the dog where they can end up with itchy skin and um, licking at their feet constantly or ear infections and other things just because the body cannot work with that type of um, poor quality protein source. Um, so that's one of the key reasons to try and avoid meat meal. If you can use real meat, um, you're going to just have such a better chance at, at achieving tip-top health. Let's see if you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, wait, now. There we go. Go ahead, Dr. Kennedy. Yep. yep. I was going to say thank you, Lucy. I absolutely agree. I see that all the time where people come in and say, my dog is allergic to chicken or to beef or something else because their only experience is from a heavily processed product. And when they switch into a fresh food that contains those same protein meat ingredients, then the pet does great. So sometimes it's just the processing nature of it that changes the way that the body responds to it. The other thing I love that Lucy brought up is that protein on paper is not available protein or amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein not available amino acids to the tissues of the body. And so when you have these byproduct uh, scenarios, you've got ground beaks and nails and feathers, which again on paper is amino acids, but the body's not able to utilize that. And notably, it causes more stress on the organs of the body to deal with some of those things. So the kidneys, one of the things that a lot of people are aware of is that kidney problems are extremely common in cats and pretty darn common in dogs these days too. And a lot of people are very concerned about dropping the level of protein in an older pet, or certainly if they have any indications of kidney problems. The big issue there is that a lot of the proteins in standard pet foods, proteins, are not providing accessible amino acids to the pet's body. However, they're creating a very large workload on the kidneys to excrete all of these byproducts. And so it does take more toll on their organ systems and lends to more disease without giving them the true nutrition that most people think they're getting. So thank you for, you know, segueing into that. Cause that's so important, I think. Mm -hmm. um, definitely. And here's another good question uh, for Lucy. Can you talk about canine diabetes, hydrated foods, and whether it's best to add less water or more water? Does that affect digestion? Is it best to slow down or increase digestion to better control glucose levels? So as the um, kitchen is a dehydrated food, this is a good place probably for you to start, Lucy. Yeah, I love yeah. talking. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Katie. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, I love that Lucy talked about replacing the, the hydration and the fluid into the food. Cause I do think that that's very important, you know, biochemically in the body for the body to be able to process that food and digest it and utilize it. But it's also obviously hydration is such a huge piece of health. And honestly, there are internal medicine specialists in the veterinary field that do have major concerns that some of the common diseases that pets get are directly related to spending a lifetime of dehydration from eating dry food. And those diets do include diabetes, pancreatitis, liver problems, and other digestive problems that can be directly linked to lack of moisture in the food. So I do think that's really important to keep all of those organ systems being able to function properly and to prevent them from breaking down into disease states. So I don't know if you add some things. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think the other the other pieces uh, Dr. Kangas was talking about earlier with kidney problems, a lot of um, veterinarians now believe that when you've got these really restricted protein levels in a senior dog that may be suffering with kidney issues, and then you're compounding the problem by having a 
really distinct lack of moisture in the diet that in addition kind of places a huge tax on the kidneys because they're they need that moisture and that's their job is to sort of process that moisture through the body. Um, I think the other thing with um, excessively dry food, if you don't add a little bit of water or get some moisture through the addition of um, fresh foods, is if you think about what dry conventional kibble looks like that's made with the process of extrusion, if once a dog has consumed it, if you've ever had the misfortune of seeing them regurgitate their meals, those brown pellets actually come back up whole. They don't, they didn't get chewed at all. So it's a misnomer that they're helpful for dental health, but they actually are swollen up with moisture. And that moisture is being robbed from the GI tract, which is, again is taxing the whole body and causing this difficulty in digestion and assimilation of the nutrients. Um, when it comes to diabetes specifically, there are two different types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. One is one of them is insulin dependent, the other is not. Um, we, with the Honest Kitchens dehydrated food specifically, we have vets who recommend a couple of different approaches and sometimes it seems to just be a matter of what's going to work best for the individual animal. Some vets will do a very restricted carbohydrate and really emphasize good quality protein and, and lower the amount of carbs and sugars in the food in order to just kind of avoid those spikes. And other vets um, recommend feeding more plentiful levels of soluble fiber, whether that comes from some um, less processed whole grains like um, whole oats or barley, um, as well as uh, vegetables and minimal fruits, but some vegetables that you will provide that soluble fiber so that you get a more steady blood sugar level that rather than having these big spikes and, and then having it plummet, maintaining a steady blood sugar level with, the, with those soluble fiber levels. Very helpful. Thank you for explaining that, Lucy. Um, um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, what, you know, now that we have been encouraged to add different foods to our dog's diet and bring in fresh and bring in variety, what should we be careful of to avoid? Are there specific foods that, you know, really are dangerous for our animals that we should know about? Yeah, there are definitely a handful of um, of foods that are known to be harmful to dogs. So um, onions would be one of the most common ones. Um, grapes and raisins, um, chocolate is is another issue. Macadamia nuts. I would also add to that list. Um, very high fat foods. So while sometimes it's tempting to want to boost up a dog's diet with lots of extra meat, you do want to be careful about not overloading them with extremely high levels of fat because that can be a potential trigger for things like pancreatitis. Particularly if you have a dog who's not used to very much dietary variety and hasn't had a huge amount. Um, so one um, particular example that springs to mind is around Thanksgiving. Sometimes people feel tempted to kind of load their dog's bowl up with loads of turkey leftovers that might include quite a bit of fatty meat um, and there is a risk for things like pancreatitis with that so that would be just another one to be a little bit more cautious about um, there are some meats and fish that um, there are, are a few concerns about feeding completely raw as well so one would be salmon because there's a parasite that can be present in salmon um, it, in its raw state that's um, rendered it um, harmless once you've cooked it. Um, and also the same goes for raw pork as well. Sometimes people recommend feed, uh, just lightly cooking that. Um, but for the most part, any type of healthy leftover from your own plate. Um, if I'm cooking a side of salmon for our family, I'll get a, like an extra large piece and, and my dogs will get a little bit of salmon in their meal on those particular days. Um, I always like to buy well caught fish and, and make sure that there's sort of no GMOs and things like that present in, in the leftovers that you're adding. Um, but any other sorts of um, fruits and veggies from your own plate can be added in provided they're not loaded with lots of sort of creamy sauce or, or excessive amounts of onions and garlic and things like that. Dr. Kangas, is there anything that you would like to add to that? And then I'll bring up a question. No, I think that was very, very well said. I agree. I mean, I would avoid anything that's got a lot of sugars. Like when people tell me they give their dogs, I'm like, well, what kind of, well, we give them a little bit of fruit. What kind of fruit do you do? And they're like, oh, we give them a banana. I'm like a whole banana for like a, you know, 15 pound dog. Oh yeah, he gets a banana every day for lunch. I'm like, oh, that's a little bit much. So, you know, some things are more sugary. 
than others. And so berries are considered, I know Lucy brought that up, considered an excellent choice because they're very low in sugar, yet really high in antioxidant, obviously colors of the rainbow. So just be cognizant of what foods might you know, be a little uh, better for the body when you're feeding the fresh foods. But again, yes, the, the raisins and the grapes, you would definitely want to avoid um, onions, certainly in large amounts. Uh, I think Lucy named the big ones. So that is perfect. So what is the ideal ratio of proteins versus fats for our dogs? I think that's still perhaps fairly controversial. I would love to hear what um, Lucy has to say on that. There is a lot of different ranges going on out there. And, you know, there's even ketogenic diets coming out where the protein and fat are fairly equivalent or even a little higher in fat. Um, I really appreciate, I'll back up and say what Lucy said about being a little cautious with fat with dogs, especially when they're not used to that or if it's poor quality fat. So that can make a big difference too. Um, and anybody who has a history of a weak digestion or certainly a pancreatitis, you wanna be a little cautious with that. But there are more and more diets coming out with higher fat levels, I think, than what perhaps was used and there are uh, health reasons for that, but it can be very critical as to how you're implementing these, what diet you're choosing, and the history of your pet and their, you know, health condition in choosing that. But I'm uh, interested to see if uh, Lucy's seeing anything from the industry on what she's seeing with that ratio as well. I, I think I would um, agree absolutely with Katie on on her answer there. There's, there's no sort of perfect or ideal ratio that's right for every single dog. At the Honest Kitchen, we really try to drive home the fact that every dog is an individual and you really need to feed the dog that's in front of you rather than sort of take on these blanket rules or um, guidelines and assume that one person's philosophy is going to be right for every single animal. Um, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. I think the other is to sort of look to nature and think about proper balance. Um, if you took even just literally a cup of ground fresh beef, the amount of protein that's in there would probably be around sort of high teens to mid 20s percent protein. And fat could be sort of around you know, 18 or so percent protein might be a little bit higher. It's not vast. And when some of the companies that are coming out with really massively high levels of protein at around sort of 42 percent combined with a severe lack of moisture, you can actually risk some um, unnecessary taxation on the kidneys and the other organs in the body. So I always like to try and sort of emulate what sorts of protein and fat levels are in natural foods and in a in a our dog's wild ancestors prey models um obviously those would be more heavily loaded with meat than probably a lot of commercial diets have um but it, in the industry, we're trying to balance creating something that's biologically appropriate in terms of fat protein and moisture content with also ensuring that there are plentiful other nutrients. So ASCO, which is our regulatory body, the Association of American Feed Control Officials, they have, I think it's about 22 key nutrients that need to be provided into the animal's diet. And we want to have as many of those as possibly be provided through real whole food sources. So we want our vitamin A to come come from things like carrot and pumpkin. We want our um, lutein and um, magnesium and things to come from spinach and, and leafy greens and kale and things like that. We don't want to have too many of those things having to be provided through the vitamin mineral premix. Um, so there's lots of different things to think about in formulating a food and making sure that we've got a plethora of those other natural key nutrients in addition to only thinking about the, the protein and fat content. Mm -hmm. Yes, so much of what you share, Lucy, reminds me of Ayurveda and what the foundational principles are in that body of knowledge, which is alignment with nature. So whether it's and it's individuation. 
because nature is individuated, even though there are themes that are constant within all aspects of life, every jay bird is different from the next. Uh, you know, they can have different personalities, their body can handle foods differently, they have different preferences. So, you know, when we look at how to live in alignment with nature, we can really hone that into our animal's life as well, recognizing that there is no one size fits all. But the most important thing is to stay connected there, to not pull them too far away because we all are animals, but we're, you know, dogs, it's a little more obvious that they're animals and leaving them to be that expression of nature that they are, their food can support that so well. So we've got another question that came in here. Oh, let me, um, we can only have one mic going at a time apparently. So let me mute myself and I'll unmute. And then if I could go back to that last question, I was actually going to bring up the um, Karen Becker's presentation that Amanda and I both uh, attended together last year. She did talk about evolutionarily going back to nature that the fat and protein would be more equivalent. But I wanted to clarify it's when you say ratio um, that can bring up a couple of conceptions and it's not that the fat and the protein are equal by weight when you're having a one-to-one -one. it's calories coming from fat versus calories coming from protein can be a one-to-one -one. and fat is much more dense in calories so you know that's going to skew what a lot of people's thoughts are on just it's not like you're you know comparing fat to protein by volume so i just wanted to you know clarify that the other thing from a veterinary standpoint is if pets do have a background of pancreatitis sensitivity or, or pancreatitis disease, or they just have trouble digesting new foods or, or fatty foods, as long as it's healthy fat, I'm okay with supporting small amounts if it's appropriate for that pet. But what I like to do is also provide the tools through nutritional supplements and you know other changes, lifestyle changes, and potentially even herbs to help the body to digest more appropriately. So if they've been on a heavily processed food and they don't, their body doesn't know these fresh foods yet and how to assimilate them, sometimes they need some assistance. A lot of dogs or humans, your gallbladder gets sludgy. The bile's sitting in there, it's all sludged up, it gets, it gets hard. Sometimes it turns into gallbladder stones which need to be removed surgically. A lot of dogs have issues with gallbladder sludge or we call it mucoceles. There are some key nutrients and nutritional supplements that help to thin and mobilize the bile so that it's helping to digest the fat. It's not creating so much workload for the pancreas. Everybody's able to you know, digest a little bit better. So I just wanted people to know that just because your pet has a history of potentially having problems digesting fats, it doesn't mean that there aren't steps that we can take to supply their body with good adjustments so that they then can handle new foods in a much better way. So thank you for allowing mm -hmm. that in. Yeah, well, it's so important. And thank you for helping us to understand it. It, it. You know, like these things do, it gets a little complicated. And especially when applying it to our animal friends that we don't know quite as much about as our average consumer. So um, Lucy, do you want to answer the question that's up on the screen now? Yes. That's it. Um, it's a possibility that we will create a veterinary line um, in the future. It's not in our immediate um, plans in the next couple of years, but it's certainly something that we've had conversations about uh, in terms of creating sort of a more um, food therapeutic type of line in conjunction with um, some of our uh, friends in the veterinary community. I might end up uh, roping Dr. Kangas in to help us with that when the time comes. Um, in terms of um, within our existing Honest Kitchen line for feeding a dog with diabetes and things like hypothyroid, um, I, I think a, a higher soluble fiber, as, as we talked about earlier, something like the grain-free turkey food might be a good choice. It's got quite plentiful um, protein levels, um, but moderate carbohydrates, and, and those carbs are, are pretty high in soluble fiber. So that's quite a good choice for many dogs. Um, the grain-free fish and grain-free beef are also good choices in terms of being on the lower fat side. Um, for things like hypothyroid, um, the addition of... Um, seaweed is actually a really good choice because it provides iodine into the diet which helps to sort of balance and regulate the thyroid gland um, and then in terms of 
amending the carbohydrate ratio, you can actually add extra meat. All of our foods are formulated with balanced calcium phosphorus ratio. So you could add your own um, either raw meaty bones or raw or cooked meat, obviously not cooked bones. Um, but you can then, by doing that, actually increase the protein and fat levels in each bowl of food and, and in so doing reduce the carbohydrate percentage uh, as, a, as its proportion of the whole bowl. Um, so there's a few things that you can do and obviously we'd recommend working with a, a reputable veterinarian to help sort of oversee those food additions, but it, it certainly can be done. Oh, that's really interesting. That's the way that I have come to feed my animals is with our honest kitchen as a base and then additive additional foods on top, depending on what that unique animal needs. And that's what really inspired me to do this dinner for your dogs is because so oftentimes I'll be talking with a client or one of our audience members and they'll wonder how can you combine all of those things? What they literally will ask, do you just like throw it into the bowl together? Is that okay? So that's why I want to show people the various ways that you can do it at and add in your supplements and even your goat milks and yogurt you know it all can go in one bowl together i mean as far as i know is that correct dr kangas that that's safe to as long as your your animal is in good balanced health you can go ahead and combine different ingredients in a safe way absolutely i love to recommend that and again it doesn't necessarily have to be uh you know all combined equivocally for every meal, there can mm -hmm. be rotation between different meals and different days, but I'm definitely a big fan of combining. I would love to add just a couple of comments to back up what Lucy said about the hypothyroid from a medical standpoint, veterinary integrative standpoint. One of, one of the many factors that I think is lending to so many thyroid diseases today is a deficiency in trace minerals. And as Lucy mentioned, iodine is notably important for the thyroid. Each one of the trace minerals, iodine, potassium, selenium, zinc, magnesium, they all have critical roles in the endocrine balance and the you know glandular organs in the body. And so many diets of today for, for dogs and you know animals and humans are trace mineral deficient. And that is one of the things that's lending to so many thyroids being either sluggish or out of balance. And so I really like to look at that. The other thing from a whole body health perspective that I think is really nice to share is that when there's thyroid problems too, looking at the liver, it's not always you know very black and white like we think it might be when you get a diagnosis, uh, but from a nutritional functional medicine standpoint, three quarters of the conversion of T3 to T4 in the body occurs in the liver. And so if you have a sluggish thyroid, you may be wanting to look to the liver too and help the decongest the liver and, you know, give liver support. But again, back to nutrition being so important, being on a healthy diet is already going to give liver support compared to being on a processed diet. So all of these things factor into any one specific diagnosis, just like hypothyroid. So just wanted to add that in too. Yeah, that's wonderful to know and to remember. Um, what is, oh, I, tried, I tried to be adventurous and unmute all of us. <laughs> no, <laughs> it says no. Um, just to wrap this up, because we've gone far beyond our time now and it's all good because this conversation is so interesting. But just curious, what trace minerals, what's the best way to add those in or if we're feeding these higher quality great diets, are we okay? Are we safe to assume we're okay? I would love to hear from Lucy on that. I generally recommend for people to add an additional kelp supplement, high quality kelp or seaweed supplement to their pet's diet. Um, but I would love for Lucy to tell us the the components of what they have in the Honest Kitchen diets. And if that uh, meets the daily trace mineral requirements, or if you agree or suggest to add in additional beyond that. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with kelp. It's a, it's a wonderful food source. Um, unfortunately, AFCO has put some um, new regulations in place where they've established um, safe upper limits of iodine, which not everybody agrees with, but um, we've actually ended up kind of uh, reducing some of the kelp that we use in our foods in order to accommodate those new 
AFCO guidelines in their infinite wisdom. Um, but you can absolutely add extra kelp if, if you'd like to, based on what your what issues you're trying to address with your own individual dog. Um, there are other sort of natural food compounds that are good, great sources of minerals. Um, obviously, if you fed um, raw meaty bones and things, you're going to get plenty of calcium and phosphorus and things like that. We do use a human food grade premix in the Honest Kitchens foods, so that sort of helps to fill in the gaps of some of the things that are not provided by the, the raw ingredients themselves. And I think that's a really critically important thing to think about in terms of when a lot of conventional pet foods and very heavily processed sort of old fashioned brands, I'll call them, use a multitude of different vitamins and minerals in their premix. I mean, some of the prescription diets literally contain about 22 to 23 five different um, nutrients in the form of an artificial premix and it just really shows how lacking the in, the actual food ingredients were in the first place and what has to be supplemented into the food and if you scrutinize that premix there's a very diverse spectrum of quality in terms of um bioavailability of ingredients and and um, opposed to that cost of ingredients um, so you could use for for example for an iron source it's legally possible to use essentially rust or iron oxide ferrous oxide can literally be used as a legal source of iron in pet food and it's just unbelievable that the most common cause uses of rust or um, iron oxide in industry would be sort of pigments in paint colors and yet it's perfectly okay for some pet food companies to use that as a sort the source of iron in their in their pet food products so that's something to be very aware of when you're selecting what food you're going to feed is is where are the nutrients actually coming from obviously fresh ingredients is best um, but what's being supplemented in the form of the premix you really need to look at uh, what sources are being used very good. Thank you, Lucy. And Dr. Kingis, just as our last question, because it was written in ahead of time, so I want to make sure that we have a moment to address it. I know it's a big answer. <laughs> it doesn't just take two minutes. But basically, the gist of the question was, where can I find research, evidence that supports fresh food versus dry food, especially some of these um, prescription formulated diets? What's the best way to reference what's been done um, research wise? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And again, that could take quite some time to address really well. Um, and what I would suggest is maybe we include a few links to some of the resources that I would recommend to, you know, use for people. Again, to state there is so much controversy in the, you know, nutritional um, arena, whether you're talking animals or people. So you could look up different studies that will literally contra contradict each other. The other thing to keep in mind, although it is nice to look for studies, I mean, we want to see that someone's scientifically evaluated. Is this working? Is this not working? However, there are a whole lot of studies that everyone knows are very biased and studies can produce results depending on who's doing them and what their focus and their aim is. And unfortunately, regarding the prescription diets in the veterinary industry, the vast majority of studies that have been done in veterinary nutrition to date have a biased background because they are funded and promoted and designed by the companies that make the foods that they're trying to sell and promote. So luckily there are some wonderful organizations and individuals that are stepping up to be leading authorities and trying to create research that is not biased. And I would say some of the resources that I would follow is there's two board certified veterinary nutritionists who are known to be you know real supportive of the holistic or the or the fresh food side of things but they are traditionally trained veterinary board certified uh nutritionists and um that is dr donna radidic and dr joe barges and they are both i believe now in cornell um, and on the faculty for, um, for medicine and uh, nutrition. Uh, but Dr. Barges also has a background, I think he used to be at University of Tennessee or other places, has a background as a neurologist and a urologist as well. So talk about someone who can tie together the kidney and bladder problems with disease. They are both really promoting fresh food. They've got a lot of great stuff online. They've got interviews 
Um, you can watch them live interviewed uh, with Dr. Karen Becker. Karen Becker is another great resource to follow when it comes to fresh food. She backs up a lot of her discussions with either research or, you know, trending information that's coming out from reliable sources. She interviews a lot of uh, very credible uh, experts. So I would say those people are really good to follow as well. So there's some great stuff and there's more and more uh, reports and at least uh, evaluations that are coming out to look at fresh food versus uh, processed food. One more thing that I'll bring up is there's a company called Just Food for Dogs, which also originated in Southern California uh, and now is going nationwide. And they, of course, create fresh foods that are cooked. They are also having veterinarians do studies to actually look at and evaluate scientifically the results in pet health from dry food versus fresh food. So I really commend their um, presence in the industry today. And I really appreciate the fact that I think they're creating a bridge from conventional veterinarians that have been so ingrained to believe that heavily processed foods are what we should be feeding pets to feeding fresh food. And I think they're now gaining the trust and respect um, of and credibility from conventional veterinarians. And so look for more and more great information coming out because this is going to come to more and more light as we go. That's fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Kangas, so much for all of that information. And it really just helps us to kind of put the whole story together and be part of this evolution. There's a revolution and an evolution happening right here before us. And each of us is part of that. And to recognize that that's why there's not all this history for us to look at or all of these um, this extensive details because it's now, it's now, it's happening. We're seeing the results through the animals that we're feeding, and, yes. um, and both of you can be such a huge, playing such a huge part in that. I really commend both of you. Um, I want to unmute your mic in a moment and give you a, a chance for any final words. Um, I, I think just really emphasizing. Um, that there are multiple different ways that you can incorporate fresh foods into your pet's diet. Um, you can just do like a few little healthy extras into, into your dog's bowl, into his regular meals, um, making your own homemade treats. You could do um, frozen parfaits and popsicles and all sorts of different fun ways. So um, don't feel intimidated. Um, science is wonderful, but I think science is in some ways got its claws a little bit too much into the pet food industry where people become frightened to use common sense and to feed their dogs like they would their human family. Um, so use common sense, think about nature, maintain balance and have a little bit of fun with what you add in as long as you're using um, safe, healthy ingredients and, and storing and handling them properly. There are lots of easy and very accessible ways to incorporate some fresh food and think about that variety in rotational feeding. That's fantastic. Thank you so much to both of you for your time. Again, all of your sharing and wisdom, your work in this field. Um, thank you to all of you listeners for being part of this, for asking your great questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but uh, we will come back. I'll add some of the um, information like the vet's names that were mentioned and some of the other links that Dr. Kangas can provide for us. I'll of course link to the Honest Kitchen so you can see the amazing products that they offer. Um, we want to also invite all of you to share this because, uh, you know, again, this is the way that we help change the industry. This is the way that we help get more animals fed well and fed the right foods. And if you can just simply put it out there, you never know who's going to stumble upon this and listen and start to add in some of these and really change their dog's life and their longevity. So we appreciate that so much. We hope everyone has a really safe and wonderful 4th of July. Again, thank you for being here with us a day early. And we will be back with you next month. I'm going to unmute all of us. We'll hear the little types, but we'll at least have a chance to say goodbye to our wonderful guests. Thank you both. Thank you. I want to thank Lucy, too, for just being such a pioneer in this industry and really creating ways of change for, uh, you know, I, I've recommended and used Honest Kitchen Foods in my practice for a long time, and I am so appreciative of such a wonderful quality, user-friendly option to be able to give people. And I have to say the results it produces alongside of many other fresh options is just 
truly rewarding and miraculous to watch. So thank you so much for all of the hard work you've done to bring our industry of feeding animals better to a much higher level and you're continuing to, to reach higher and higher. So thank you so much. And I was so glad to be a part of all this discussion today. I appreciate that and a uh, huge fan of your work and thank you for <laughs> including us and uh, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure to be able to kind of speak and get the message out and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Yay! Thank you. Bye.